Okay, so we are going to start today going over the cell. And the approach will be first to go over and show you the main parts of the cell. And then we'll go over some of the function. So on the first lab exam, it's safe to assume there'll be about nine to 10 different questions that come from the cell model. Majority will be pure identification, but then there'll be some that talks about function. So you do have to know brief functions. That will help you not just for lab, that will also help you for lecture. When I teach this section in lecture, there's at least 10 questions just based on function. I don't really put pictures on my lecture portion of the exam, but I do um, have a lot on function. All right, so let's take a look here and show you some of the main parts. If we look all the way around the periphery of the cell, all the way on the outside, there is what is called the cell membrane or plasma membrane, okay? Or cell membrane, cell wall, plasma membrane, they're all used interchangeably. And this cell wall is a barrier, right? It keeps what's on the outside of the cell on the outside and what's on the inside of the cell, it keeps it on the inside and it needs to because the pH is different. What's happening outside the cell that is called extracellular fluid is different than the fluid inside the cell called intracellular fluid. The other name for intracellular fluid is sometimes referred to as cytosol, which you see right here, cytosol. And there's the CYT, which means cell. So here's the cytosol. The fluid outside of the cell is called extracellular fluid, and sometimes it's referred to as interstitial fluid, interstitial fluid. Now, when we look at everything from the cell membrane inward towards the nucleus, this is all referred to as the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm includes the cytosol and all of these organelles that you see that we're gonna cover in a few minutes. Okay, so we have the cell membrane, which, which is a phospholipid bilayer. It has two layers, phospholipid, the outer portion of the cell membrane, and the inner portion of the cell membrane is called hydrophilic. Philic means friend of or to like. Hydro is water. So hydrophilic means the inner part of the cell membrane and the outer part of the cell membrane have to get along with water. And that makes sense because you have cytosol, which is liquid on the inside, and you have extracellular fluid on the outside. So it has to get along with water very well. The inner part of the membrane is called hydrophobic. Doesn't like water too much, hydrophobic. And the cell membrane is made up of proteins and it's made up of lipids, which is a type of fat. And the proteins are really, really important because they're like the gatekeeper. They're like the doorman at the bar or the club that determines who's allowed in and who can leave, right? Those are the proteins. All right, let's see what else we have. The very large organelle in the center, the clear, translucent section that is called the nucleus, which is not the same thing as that peach-like, orange-like structure in the center that is called the nucleolus. The nucleolus is different than the nucleus. So the nucleolus is way, way in the center. It looks like that pit. The clear section is the nucleus. And then the white sheath, this white protective covering, this is called the nuclear envelope. This is the nuclear envelope. And you'll see that the nuclear envelope has these holes. These holes are called nuclear pores. 
and those are important. Surrounding the nuclear envelope, there is this kind of aqua looking like membrane that's continuous with it. And that is called the endoplasmic reticulum. You could see here at around the three o'clock position and around the four o'clock position, there's a smooth endoplasmic reticulum and a rough endoplasmic reticulum. What gives it a rough appearance or a smooth appearance is the presence of these white speckled dots. So the white speckled dots are called ribosomes. The white speckles are called ribosomes and they can either be fixed or fixated to the endoplasmic reticulum. And if they are fixed to it, then it has a rough appearance. So we call it a rough endoplasmic reticulum. And if we don't see them attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, it has a very smooth appearance. So it's called a smooth ER, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. If they're not attached to either of them, sometimes they roam around freely in the cytoplasm. And when they're just hanging around the cytoplasm, they're just called ribosomes. When they're stuck to the endoplasmic reticulum, then we say they, they're fixed to it. And now we call it a rough endoplasmic reticulum. So you see here, these are fixed ribosomes because they're stuck or fixated to the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, let's take a look at what else we have here. We have this yellow vesicle called a lysosome and this gray one called a peroxisome. They sound similar, but we'll see shortly that they are different, lysosome and peroxisome. Here we have this structure that is called the Golgi complex or the Golgi apparatus the Golgi complex or the Golgi apparatus. And then we have the infamous mitochondria. These are mitochondria. And what's left is here, this black circle called a centrosome. And then the spindles called centrioles. The spindles are called centrioles, okay? Now let's take a look at some of their functions. So the cell membrane is the outer boundary of the cell. It's gonna protect the contents of the cell and it's gonna control the movement of what's permitted in and out. And I said it can do that because of the phospholipid bilayer. Part of it is protein, part of it is lipid and the proteins are the gatekeeper. They they can make up channels like a sodium channel, a potassium channel, a calcium channel. So they can allow certain things in and out of the cell. You will be learning all about those in your lecture when you cover the protein. Extracellular fluid. Well, we said that's the fluid outside the cell and it's also called interstitial fluid, interstitial fluid. The cytosol is the fluid of the cell and the cytoplasm is the contents of the cell. Everything outside of the nucleus and to the inside of the cell membrane is called the cytoplasm. Uh, microvilli and cilia, they're somewhat similar. They're both finger-like extensions, except the cilia are larger and the microvilli are much more smaller. The cilia, help to move the cell. Uh, they can move and they can whip around um, quickly so that it can mobilize the cell and move it around. Sometimes the cell uh, membrane is called a plasma membrane and that's where you'll see them kind of hanging off of that. They help to move material as well or debris that lie with in the respiratory tract, especially the trachea, the windpipe. There are cilia that line the trachea and they beat rhythmically. They're beating from inferior to superior to try and help you 
to try and help prevent dust particles and debris that you may be breathing in from making it to the deeper part of the lungs. So these cilia are constantly beating upwards from inferior to superior. And there's some mucus that sit on top of that cilia. And the purpose of the mucus, it's sticky. So it allows debris to kind of adhere to that. And then you can simply cough it up rather than inhale it deeper into the lungs. The microvilli, these are much smaller. There are these finger-like extensions also off the plasma membrane, but these are really used for absorption. They act as a sponge to pull things in. And they also increase the surface area. Organelles, these are all the things that we mentioned like Golgi apparatus, nucleolus, nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, lysosomes, peroxisomes, all of those are organelles. And they're really, they just, they, if you look at the word, they're small organs, right? Organelles, organ, they're just specialized structures within the cell, but they all have different structure and shapes. And based on their structure or their form, they're gonna have slightly different function. So they perform these functions in the cell to try and help it grow, to maintain its health and well-being, and they're involved in mitosis or reproduction. We showed you the centrosome, which was that black circle that was that dense body near the nucleus, and then it had these uh, spindles, the spindle apparatus called the centrioles. Those are composed of proteins called microtubules. Microtubules, they're easier to see, they're larger. We have microfilaments as well that we'll see another type of protein when we cover muscle, but microtubules are a protein that's a little bit larger. And they form from a protein called tubulin, microtubules. The cytoskeleton is a network of a bunch of protein elements. Some are microtubules, some are microfilaments, and some are these intermediate filaments that are not quite as large as microtubules. They're not quite as small as the microfilaments. They're kind of in between. They're called intermediate filaments. And they're designed to provide structural support of the cell. Now you heard me mention ribosomes. We said ribosomes could be fixed to the endoplasmic reticulum, or they can be roaming freely in the cytoplasm. We said if they're fixed to the endoplasmic reticulum, then it doesn't have a smooth appearance. It has more of a rougher appearance. So we call it the rough ER. These ribosomes are complexes of RNA, which is ribose nucleic acid, and protein that are found in the cells. And the functions of, pro of ribosomes are to make proteins. They synthesize proteins. Well, how do they make proteins, protein synthesis? Well, they get the information from the nucleus and the nucleus has the DNA, right? It has the codes, it has the manuscript, it has the blueprint, it has the directions, if you would, to direct the cell as to what proteins need to be produced. So the nucleolus makes those ribosomes to carry out the protein synthesis, but the DNA carries the instructions as to what proteins need to be produced. So the fixed ribosomes, which are attached to the ER, uh, these are responsible for making or synthesizing proteins that can be secreted out of the cell. When something is moved out of the cell, it has to leave a vesicle. It has to exit a vesicle. So this vesicle has to move from inside of the cell to the cell membrane. And when it's at the cell membrane, it has to open up and release its contents. That method is referred to as exocytosis, exocytosis. That's the method of releasing its proteins. Now, some proteins are enzymes. 
some proteins are neurotransmitters. So it could be releasing a digestive enzyme or a protein like a neurotransmitter from that vesicle from inside the cell to outside of the cell. And that method is called exocytosis. If it's taking something into the cell, we would call that endocytosis. So endocytosis and exocytosis are opposites. The proteins first enter the endoplasmic reticulum where they're modified and packaged for secretion. The free ribosomes are in the cytoplasm and these ribosomes are gonna make proteins that are used for the cell. They're not gonna be exporting it outside using exocytosis. The, the proteins are really made for the cell itself. Nucleus, do not confuse nucleus with nucleolus. The nucleus is the control center and it is where the genes are located and those are called DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid, DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid. RNA is ribose nucleic acid, ribose nucleic acid is RNA. The nucleolus is where the ribosomal RNA synthesis takes place. And that nucleolus is deep to the nucleus. The endoplasmic reticulum, that is that network within the cytoplasm that's kind of continuous with the nuclear envelope, right? We saw it outside of the nucleus. And it is involved with the synthesis the modification and transport of materials that are within the cell. Now the rough ER and smooth ER, they look different. And because their structure is different, they function different. The rough ER, as I mentioned before, is continuous with the nuclear envelope. If it has ribosomes attached to it, meaning they're fixated to it, we call it the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now, what does the rough endoplasmic reticulum do? Besides producing proteins, they make glycoproteins, another type of protein. Glyco looks like glucose, so it's like a sugar type of protein. And it produces phospholipids. Well, where did you hear this word phospholipid before? Well, that's when I talked about briefly the cell membrane, and I said it is a phospholipid bilayer, meaning it's got two layers of lipids and phosphates, phospholipid. When you get into the cell in lab and you get into a little bit of chemistry, you will see the composition of this phospholipid bilayer, the outer and inner part of the cell membrane, how it looks. The smooth ER does not have ribosomes attached. It is continuous also with the rough ER, but this one doesn't make protein. So what is it doing? It is involved with carbohydrate metabolism and the synthesis and modifying of a type of uh, lipid, lipids. Um, so these lipids can include fat, cholesterol, things of that nature. Yes, there is cholesterol in the cell membrane. You need it. There is fat in the cell membrane. You need it. There's protein in it. You need it. So producing and modifying these fats are very, very important. Uh, the organ that's highly concentrated with smooth endoplasmic reticulum is the liver because the liver is the organ that makes cholesterol for us the liver makes cholesterol and it makes it in the evening. Usually at nighttime is when most cholesterol is produced. So when people have high cholesterol or low cholesterol, it's really the amount that your liver is producing. The amount that you eat in food does not change your cholesterol levels very much, not at all, okay? It is controlled by your liver. And the higher, your cholesterol, if someone's cholesterol is going up, it usually indicates that there's some vascular or blood vessel issues or damage that's happening 
and the cholesterol was going to patch up and smooth out any damage within the lining of those blood vessels. Okay, let's look at the Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, peroxisomes, and mitochondria now. So the Golgi apparatus, this consists of a bunch of these flattened saccules, and they're involved in modifying the proteins that the endoplasmic reticulum produced, especially the ribosomes, the rough ER. So it can take them in, and then the Golgi complex or apparatus is going to sort them out and it's going to ship them out almost like a, like a UPS or a FedEx. And I'll show you what that looks like in another model. The lysosomes and peroxisomes, they're similar but different, right? So the lysosomes are going to contain these digestive enzymes and they're going to be dumping hydrogens into anything that has invaded the cell, anything that could be pathogenic, anything that's a bacteria, any microbe, anything that comes into the cell, this lysosome can migrate towards it. It opens up and it dumps hydrogens into that. The more hydrogens that you dump into a solvent, let's say you have a glass of water and you add lots of hydrogen to it, you now lower the pH. You make it very acidic. And when you increase the acidity, you can kill or destroy whatever that microbe or foreign bacteria or pathogen may be. Okay. So if you look at the pH scale, anything, the pH scale goes from zero to 14. Seven is right in the middle. Anything from zero to like 6.9999999, that's going to be an acid. And anything above 7.0 is going to be an alkaline or a base, okay? All right, peroxisomes, these are, uh, those were the, the lysosomes were yellow on that model, right? The peroxisomes were that grayish structure. These are also filled with enzymes, but these are different. These are designed to detoxify harmful substances. So if someone is taking drugs or they're drinking alcohol or they're eating foods with colors in it and food dyes, your body has to figure out how to detoxify that. So these peroxisomes are highly concentrated in the liver, which we know helps to detoxify, as well as the kidneys. Both your liver and kidneys are involved with detoxification. They are also designed to neutralize free radicals. Free radicals, is what damages our DNA and our proteins in the body. And peroxisomes are also involved in breaking down fats. When we break down fats, we call that beta oxidation. Beta oxidation is the continual removal of two carbons at a time, not the alpha, but the beta carbon. So when you remove that second carbon, you start breaking down these long chains of fatty acids, which is really a long carbon chain. When you look at chemistry, you'll be reviewing beta oxidation a bit. The mitochondria, this is the site of energy production. And the energy production, the energy currency is called adenosine triphosphate, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Okay, so then we can go back and we can go, all right, there's the mitochondria, energy production. Here's the nuclear envelope, nuclear pores, nucleus, nucleolus, Golgi complex or apparatus, centrosome, centrioles that is involved with mitosis that we'll see in just a minute, the gray peroxisome, this is a peroxisome up here too. This is the yellow lysosome. This is a lysosome here. Here is the rough ER. Here is the rough ER. And here is the smooth ER. Here is the cytosol and the cell membrane. Okay, that should be a good little review for you. Let's make sure we covered everything and we did. So let's close out that PowerPoint. And let's look at this 
which is very, very similar. Okay. So let's zoom in a little bit here if we can. Make it a little larger. Okay, so here is the cell membrane at around the one o'clock position out here. As we move to the two o'clock position, you can see centrioles. So the centrioles are the yellow spindles. You can see how they're arranged. The centrosome is the black circle. At the three o'clock position is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You can see the white dots. Those are the ribosomes. Out here, this is the cytosol, right? The clear portion is cytosol. At around the four o'clock position, you can see it labeled the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. At the six o'clock position here, the yellow lysosome. Look at the nucleus, which is the clear translucent section, but way in the center is the nucleolus with the white nuclear envelope and the holes are the nuclear pores. You could see at the nine o'clock position, the labeling for the cytosol. The layers of pancakes here are the Golgi apparatus or Golgi complex. And you can see these little vesicles. So the Golgi complex took in these proteins and it repackaged them and shipped them out through these secretory vesicles. So they're gonna secrete something. So these can move, these can move to the cell membrane, to the wall, they can open up and release its contents. That's called exocytosis. When it moves to the cell membrane, you can see it kind of opens up there. Exocytosis is when it secretes its product to outside of the cell. Now, if it's taking something in, that's endocytosis, endocytosis. Okay, I think we've covered everything on that. Let's look at the next one. Same model, we're just kind of zooming in on these sections of it. So here's a peroxisome, here is your mitochondria. This is ATP production or energy production. The peroxisome, that's for your detoxification of harmful substances. It also breaks down fatty acids through beta oxidation destroys re free radicals. This is your secretory vesicle that came from the lysosome. Uh, I'm sorry, that came from the Golgi complex. I was going to say that lysosomes also come from the Golgi complex. Here is your cytosol. Here is your cell membrane. The black circle is the centrosome with the centrioles inside. Here's your rough endoplasmic reticulum. On an exam, you never want to put rough ER. You don't want to use abbreviations, not on exams. You have to write out the full word. So rough endoplasmic reticulum. Again, you can see the cytosol, the clear liquid. In the center is the nucleolus, the clear translucent sphere, that is the nucleus. And then the nuclear envelope is the white sheath protecting that, and the holes are the nuclear pores. The yellow structure at six o'clock is the lysosome, which migrates towards pathogens or microbes. It dumps hydrogens in there, lowers the pH, makes it very acidic, and destroys it. Again, another look at the rough endoplasmic reticulum with the fixed ribosomes attached to it. This would be the smooth endoplasmic reticulum here. Here's another one that looks smooth. There's no ribosomes attached to it. All right, so that brings an end. Let me close out the cell. And what I'd like to show you now is mitosis. So to do that, I'd like to show you a five minute video on that first. So let's go into that quick video. Here it is, the mitosis video. Let's watch together.
Cell division is required for an organism to grow, mature, and maintain tissues. During the mitotic phase, a cell will undergo mitosis to form two new nuclei and then divide to form two new individual cells during cytokinesis. Mitosis is the process of dividing the duplicated DNA of a cell into two new nuclei. Mitosis is split into distinct stages. The first stage is prophase. The DNA condenses, organizes, and the classic chromosome structure appears. Next comes prometaphase, where microtubules attach to the chromosomes. This step is followed by metaphase, where the chromosomes align. Metaphase is followed by anaphase, where the chromosomes separate. Finally, during telophase, nuclear membranes reappear around the two sets of chromosomes. So the main phases so far, um, I like to use the little silly mnemonic uh, PMAT, P-M-A-T, PMAT. So there's going to be prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And at the very end, we'll see something called interphase. Okay, but P, mat, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Mitosis is now complete. After mitosis, two new cells are formed by a process called cytokinesis. Mitosis is only one part of what is called the cell cycle. For many eukaryotic cells, a cell is duplicated every 24 hours. Most of the life of a cell is spent in interphase. Interphase consists of three stages called G1, S, and G2. G1, or GAP1, is the first growth stage of interphase. In G1, the cell grows to nearly its full size and performs many of its specific biochemical functions that aid the organism. Next is the S, or synthesis phase. This is an important stage because it is during the S phase that DNA in the nucleus is replicated. The cell next enters another growth stage called G2, or GAP2. It is during G2 that the cell finishes growing. Once the cell has duplicated DNA in the nucleus and two centrosomes have appeared in the cytoplasm, mitosis can begin. For a typical eukaryotic cell, this will last about 80 minutes. During the first stage of mitosis, called prophase, we first see the classic chromosome structure. This occurs through a condensation process. At the same time, protein strands called microtubules appear from the centrosomes in animals. Finally, a structure found within the nucleus, the nucleolus disappears. Next, prometaphase begins when the nuclear membrane is broken down. At the same time, microtubule strands or spindle fibers are growing from the centrosomes. These strands attach to a protein structure called the kinetochore. One kinetochore is attached to the centromere of each sister chromatid. Next comes metaphase. During this stage, the sister chromatids align along the center of the cell so that both chromatids face toward opposite poles of the cell. Now the sister chromatids are ready to be separated. This occurs during anaphase through a shortening of the microtubules attached to the kinetochores. Additionally, the poles of the cell move farther apart, causing increased separation of sister chromatids. At the end of anaphase, the sister chromatids have moved to the two ends of the cell. Telophase is the final stage of mitosis. It is here the components of the new cells begin to appear. At this point, the spindle fibers are broken up. A new nuclear membrane surrounds the chromosomes at the end of each cell, and the chromosomes uncoil and return to an uncondensed state. Mitosis is now complete. The formation of two cells is all that remains. Following mitosis, the cell undergoes a process called cytokinesis. First, the cell is compressed by a contractile ring that divides the cell in nearly equal halves. 
By now, the organelles in the cell have been replicated and are now divided between the two halves of the cell. This includes mitochondria, Golgi bodies, and the rough ER. Plant cells also have chloroplasts. Once split, the two new cells are now fully in the G1 stage of interphase and ready again to begin their growth. Let's watch the process one more time. Mitosis begins with prophase. Notice the DNA condensing into chromosomes during this stage. Microtubules appear during prometaphase, and the nuclear membrane breaks down. Metaphase occurs when the chromosomes are aligned at the center of the cell. During anaphase, the chromosomes are moving apart. The telophase stage is marked by the appearance of new nuclear membranes. This is the end of mitosis. Finally, the splitting of the cell occurs during cytokinesis. The two new cells are now ready to grow and perform their specialized functions. Okay, so that was really a great um, virtual visual on mitosis because it's really hard to kind of draw and duplicate what's happening here. Um, the take homes for us is being able to identify prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and uh, interphase. So you'll see here going from top left to top right, and then we start moving down. It is in sequential order, number one, number two, three, four, all the way down to seven, eight, down at the bottom. So numbers one, two, and three are all prophase. They just divided up into early prophase, middle prophase, and late prophase. Number four is where these chromosomes are really lined up in the center, okay? But you can see the difference. This is really the key because a lot of students confuse number four and number five. So if you look at metaphase to anaphase, they could be confusing because it looks like they're really both aligned in the center. But if you look at the positioning, right? If you look here, the, the positioning compared to here looks different. So what's happening in metaphase, they really are just aligned in the center. But in number five, in anaphase, the spindles are starting to retract. They're starting to pull back in both directions to go to their pole. And when it does, look what happens to the chromosomes, right? Just think about if this string here is pulling to the left, then which direction would these wings move? They would flare up as these are being pulled back, okay? So that's the key difference. Here, there's, there's slack. There's no tension. Here, there's no slack. So these start off folded in this position, but once these start to pull back, now it changes their, the wings. They change their orientations in both directions. So early, middle, late prophase, Four is metaphase. Then we have early anaphase right here. And then here we still have anaphase. So you have two phase early. If you want to call this late, that's fine. So early and late anaphase. And now you can really see the invagination that's taking place on both sides you can really start to see the two cells that are starting to kind of start to pinch off, but not quite there. That's telophase. Once they fully invaginate and fold in, you get your two separate cells. Okay, and that's your interphase. This is where cells spend most of their time, according to that video that we just watched. Okay, 
So again, early, middle, late prophase, one, two, three. Metaphase is only one phase, that's four. These are both anaphase, one is early, one is late, or just anaphase. Then telophase, you could see the two cells really starting to invaginate. They're starting to pinch off, but they're really not quite there yet. But here they have separated into two. That's the, your interphase. Okay. So you'll probably just see two questions on that. Okay. On the exam, on one of these phases. Okay. Now, what I'd like to focus on now that we did the cell, we did mitosis. Now, when cells come together, when cells come together, they make tissues. Okay, let me stop my screen share for a second so I can see everybody and you can see me. So when cells come together, they come together by joining through cell junctions. You'll learn about that in the lecture. Cell junctions can be called a tight junction, a gap junction, desmosomes, hemidesmosomes, adherens junctions. They have different ways to unite and bring cells together. When cells come together, they make tissues. And we said we have four different types of tissues, epithelial, connective, muscle, and nerve. Now, muscle and nerve, those two are the easiest categories because in muscle, there's only three types, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Skeletal muscle attaches to your skeleton. You have voluntary conscious control over it. It looks striated, meaning as light passes through these protein filaments on a microscope, it goes light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. We call that striations. Cardiac muscle has a similar appearance. It's also striated, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, as light passes through the proteins. But we know the cardiac, we know the heart is not voluntary, it's involuntary. Skeletal muscle is voluntary. You can move your arm, you can move your wrist, you can consciously and voluntarily do that, but you can't increase your heart rate on command. Okay. Uh, smooth muscle, on the other hand, is also involuntary. There's no striations. That's why it's called smooth. It looks smooth under a microscope. And we found, we find them around organs that you can't control, right? I mean, you can't make, a, a woman cannot make her uterus contract or not contract. That happens automatically based on hormones. You can't say, um, um, I want my arteries to dilate and open up and lower my blood pressure, right? It can't quite happen on command. Now you can get yourself in a relaxed parasympathetic state and over the course of 20 to 30 minutes, go from a moment of stress where you could be sympathetically driven, which raises your blood pressure, to listening to music, relaxing, meditating, getting calm, cool, and collected, getting more parasympathetically and getting relaxed, then your blood vessels can open up and dilate and blood pressure goes down. That can happen over a long period of time, but it can't happen like that. Okay, so that's smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is also around your intestines and your colon and your trachea. So muscles are easy to go over. That's not hard. Nerve is also easy to go over because a nerve or a main component of a neuron, I always describe it as looking like fingers, your hand, and your palm because a neuron has three parts a part that looks like your fingers that are called dendrites, the palm, which would be the cell body, and then your forearm, which would be the axon. That's it. Neuron has those three main parts, dendrites that attach to the cell body, and then an axon that goes away from it. Those are the three main parts of a neuron. Also pretty simple. The two types of tissues that take more time to cover are epithelium and connective tissue. Now, 
epithelial tissue, when we look at it under a microscope, is a bunch of cells packed closely together. And the best way I could describe it is if you think of a, a piece of paper that has a grid on it, like grid paper that you're, you want to graph something out, all it is is a bunch of boxes, right? Each box is a cell, but they're all so closely packed together on grid paper. So if you think of the grid paper, that would be what epithelial looks like, a bunch of cells packed closely together with very little space between each of those squares. That's epithelium. But connective tissue is if you have a cell here, a cell here, a cell here, right? They're, you could see many of them in your field of view, but they're not on top of each other. They're not closely packed. You have lots of what is called extracellular matrix surrounding it. But lots of cells, they're just far apart from each other. They're not right on top of each other. Okay, so that's going to be one of the classical differences between epithelium and connective. And next week we'll go into more detail as to all of the different subcategories to connective tissue. But for today, we're going to cover blood, which is liquid connective tissue. We'll cover bone, which also falls under connective tissue. And then we'll do the skin. Now we'll do the skin last because the skin has all four types of tissues in it. It has nerve, it has muscle, it has connective tissue and has epithelial tissue. It has all four types, okay? So I'll go through that with you as well. All right, now let me go back to the screen share and we will start, I believe we're going to do blood first. Uh, now let's do bone first. Okay, so when we talk about bone, when we talk about bone, um, when you look at bones, bones can be classified into many different types. So when you do bones in lecture, um, you will discover that there are some long bones and there are some short bones and there are some flat bones and there are irregular bones. So we have different types of classifications of bones. We're gonna spend a whole lot of time on the second exam talking about long bones. Now, when we talk about long bones, when we talk about long bones, long bones have some classical features to it. The humerus is a long bone. The radius is a long bone. Each of your fingers and the phalanges are long bones. The femur, the tibia, these are long bones. The proximal end and the distal end, the proximal and the distal end, the proximal and distal end, the proximal and distal end of each of these bones is knobby. So the proximal and distal end of long bones is called a proximal and distal epiphysis. A proximal and distal epiphysis. Whereas the shaft of the bone is called a diaphysis. So you have a proximal and distal epiphysis and the shaft of the bone is called a diaphysis. The shaft of the bone is called compact bone. It's more solid. And the proximal and distal ends of the bone are more spongy. They have a spongy appearance. Okay, so I'm gonna show you what compact bone looks like spongy. By the way, it sounds, it looks spongy. It looks very porous, right? Like that, it has pores through it. Compact is more solid. So we are going to look at compact bone now. And one of the main features of compact bone is called the osteon. 
osteo is bone, like osteology, osteon. And the way I describe an osteon to my students is imagine that someone had to chop down a tree for whatever reason. Maybe it lived through a few storms, but it started to lean and it was too close to someone's house, so they needed to chop it down. When you look at what's left of the tree, when you look at the stump and you look down on it like a bird's eye view, what do you see? You see a bunch of all these concentric rings. When you see a bunch of rings, one inside the other, inside the other, inside the other, that appearance is what we call an osteon. Okay, so now that I describe that to you, let's go back and let's take a look. So at quick glance, right, that's what I wanted you to see. So if you look in here, you can see all of these circles, all of these concentric rings. Each of these are called osteons. So here's an osteon, here's an osteon, another one, another one, another one. These two wedding cake appearance looking like structures that are third dimensional coming out at us. Each of these is an osteon. Not each ring, not each concentric ring, but all of these combined would be one osteon. A second osteon, third, fourth, fifth. there's so many different osteons, okay? All right, so let's take a look at some of the structures of an osteon. So here's a bone, and all the way on the right side, this would be where it kind of looks bluish gray, right? That kind of sky blue appearance. That's called the periosteum, that is the outer portion of bone. And as we start moving to the left, we're going deeper, 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 deeper. And here where this concavity is, that is the inside of the bone. That's called the endosteum. So there's a periosteum on the outside of the bone, an endosteum on the inside of the bone. And bone is vascular. You see the blood vessel, you can see the artery, this nutrient artery piercing through the periosteum, feeding each of these osteons, you can see not only does it branch through and cut through, but then it has these, you know, linear branches that go right through the center of each osteon. Okay, the center of it is called a haversian canal or a central canal. Let's look at the bird's eye view here. Again, the central canal right there in the center is also known as the haversian canal. And that's where the blood vessels, that nutrient artery that perforated through the periosteum, it goes through, but then has many branches going through the haversian canal or central canal. Each of these rings going around is referred to as a concentric lamella a concentric lamella. Now between each osteon, you can see interstitial lamellae. Now interstitial lamellae are remnants, they're remnants of older osteons that were broken down. Well, why would osteons need to be broken down? Well, all tissues go through different phases they could be made and then they're broken down. You make cells and then they get broken down. You make red blood cells, they live 120 days, then they break down. You make skin cells, they live for about 30 days and then they slough off and then you make more. You make nails and hair, they grow, they die, and then you make more. You make bone and bone is being produced and then it's constantly being remodeled. So in terms of remodeling, it's like remodeling a kitchen. In order to remodel a kitchen and update it, you first have to bring in a demolition crew. The demolition crew comes in and they break down the sheetrock, they take out the old appliances, right? That's the demolition crew. And then after it's all cleared out and clean of all debris, you bring in the construction team and they lay down a new kitchen. So with bone, we have different types of cells. 
there's the two biggies are called an osteoblast and an osteoclast. The osteoblast is building up bone, whereas the osteoclast is breaking down bone, building up and breaking down, building up and breaking down, osteoblast and osteoclast, osteoblast and osteoclast. The B and osteoblast for building up bone, the C for C later, right? It breaks it down. So you have osteoblast building up the matrix, laying down calcium, laying down the cement, and then the osteoclast starts to break it down and remodel it. And then the osteoblast makes new bone and the osteoclast break it down. And you want this healthy relationship between the building up and breaking down, the building up and breaking down to be in harmony. That's healthy bone remodeling. If the osteoclasts, however, are breaking down bone faster than you can build it up, that's called osteoporosis or osteopenia, bone softening and bone wasting. Now, osteoblasts produce what's called the extracellular matrix. It's producing the calcium salts. It's making the cement. But we know that cement can harden and dry. So when the osteoblast that makes the matrix, that calcium, when it produces it, eventually it hardens and the calcium hardens. And when it does, the osteoblast gets trapped inside the matrix that it was making and it's got no place to go. It's trapped and it gets stuck. And the space that it gets stuck in is called a lacuna. So each of these empty spaces that we see is called a lacuna. And what the osteoblast now becomes, it becomes, it goes from this immature, an immature osteoblast to a mature osteocyte. So these osteocytes are actually trapped in these lacunae. So the osteoblast gets trapped in its matrix it gets stuck in this cavity called a lacuna, and now it can't produce matrix anymore. It's not even called an osteoblast. It's a mature cell called an osteocyte, okay? And osteocytes have these little extensions, these little finger-like structures that come off of them, and these finger-like structures that come off of them are called canaliculi. They're called canaliculi. So the lacuna is the hollowed out cavity. The osteocyte is what sits inside the cavity. And then the jellyfish finger-like extensions that come off of them are called canaliculi. The rings are called concentric lamellae. Concentric lamellae. Okay, let's go back up here again and take a look at some of these structures. So again, the outer part is the periosteum. The inner part is the endosteum. The concentric lamellae are those concentric rings. What's in between each osteon are called interstitial lamellae. Now, remember I said those are remnants of older osteons. What do you mean older remnants? Well, that's where the osteoclast came into play to break down the older bone. And then it lays down new bone and new osteons, okay? The outermost concentric rings that don't really form osteons, they're just called outer circumferential lamellae. Okay, here are the outer circumferential lamellae. They're just pulled out so you can see what they look like. Here are the osteocytes. Remember, they're trapped in those lacunae. Here's your nutrient artery perforating through, right? Blood, uh, blood vessels have to get into bone because bones are vascular and, and they, how else are we bringing nutrients? How else are we bringing calcium from the foods that we eat into bone? Remember bones act as a reservoir for nutrients. 
again, you can see concentric lamellae. So the red lines down here, each of these is a concentric lamellae. Here's your Haversian canal or central canal. The cavities here are called lacunae, but what sits inside of them are osteocytes. The osteocyte started off as an osteoblast. The osteoblast is your immature cell that makes the extracellular matrix. It calcifies, it hardens, and now it gets stuck in its lacunae and it's called an osteocyte, which is a mature cell. That mature cell does not produce any more matrix. Okay, just another view. Number three here in the center is your haversian canal or central canal. That's where you're gonna have arteries, veins, um, lymph and nerves that travel through there. These are concentric lamellae. These are interstitial. They don't fully make an osteon like these do. Here's a close up look at the haversian canal or the central canal. These are osteocytes. And you can see a little bit of the finger-like extensions coming off of them. Those are the canaliculis. Here's another view. Looks like Swiss cheese, right? It just looks like many concentric rings, hollowed out lacunae. Here's your central canal or the haversian canal. Here's your artery, here's your vein, here's your nerve, and here's a lymph vessel. These are the canaliculis, the finger-like extensions coming off of the osteocyte. Again, everything labeled here. Here's the green label for lacunae. These are your concentric rings and the yellow here. The ones that don't make full circles, these are just interstitial lamellae. Here's your artery, your vein, nerve, and your lymphatic vessel. They sit within the haversian canal, AKA central canal. And again, another view, hollowed out cavities, lacunae. Here's the nucleus of the osteocyte. Here are the canaliculi. These are concentric rings. Out here would be interstitial lamellae. These are concentric lamellae. This is the cell body of an osteocyte. If you just said osteocyte, I'd be happy. You don't have to say nucleus or cell body. This is the osteocyte, canaliculis are the extensions, okay? Now, what I mentioned earlier about muscle, three flavors of muscle, cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, and smooth muscle. The only one of the three that you can voluntarily control is skeletal muscle. This is the mu these are the muscles that attach to your skeleton, your biceps, your triceps, right? Your quads, your gastrocnemius. These are all things you have conscious voluntary control over. Notice the striations, right? You see all the lines, light and dark. This is referred to as striated and we see the same striations here. We don't see the striations here. It's a smooth appearance here, but in skeletal and cardiac, it is considered to be striated due to the protein filaments there. The difference between cardiac and skeleton, well, skeletal is voluntarily controlled. Cardiac is involuntarily controlled. You can't control your heart. That's one difference. The second difference is cardiac muscle is highly branched. There are many branches. It's not super structured and organized in very nice linear manner like skeletal muscle. These are highly branched. And they have what are called intercalated discs. These lines that run perpendicular to this direction, these are called intercalated discs. And all intercalated discs are, all they are is when you bring two cells together, if you take this cardio, cardiomyocyte and this cardiomyocyte, these two cardiac muscle cells, and you bring them together, 
they form, they come together. And this junction is called a gap junction. But if we were to pull them apart just a little bit and put them back together, what makes this give this more uh, horizontal uh, and vertical appearance to this, right? Perpendicular lines to this is called the intercalated disc. If we separated the intercalated disc and you looked deep inside the invaginations of the fingers, you would see the gap junctions. And gap junctions are used to bring cells together where cells need fast and rapid forms of communication. So nerve cells and muscle cells, the heart has to communicate super quick, right? The right atrium and left atrium have to talk to each other. They got to know that they're going to beat at the same time. And then the ventricles have to know they're beating at the same time. So heart cells come together through these gap junctions that allow the transfer of chemical messengers from one heart cell to another super rapidly. Okay, so let's go back. So we can see that cardiac muscle is highly branched. We have these intercalated discs holding them together. Skeletal muscle is striated. When you cover muscle in lecture, and eventually we will do it uh, for lab exam three, we'll talk about the protein filaments involved in making skeletal muscle. Maybe you've heard about them in the past. You have actin and myosin. Actin and myosin are the two main contractile proteins of muscle. And then we have troponin and tropomyosin, which are the regulatory proteins. They're involved in turning on or turning off contractions, okay? So skeletal muscle is striated. It is voluntary. Cardiac muscle, striated, involuntary. And your smooth muscle, involuntary, no striations, smooth. You find these around your blood vessels you find them around your organs, like the uterus and the intestines and the colon and the trachea, right? Anything where you see tubes, anywhere where you see tubes, like if you have, uh, if this is the, your intestines and then they constrict, the smooth muscle tightens them, you're constipated. If the smooth muscle relaxes and the intestines open up, now you have diarrhea. If this is a blood vessel and the smooth muscle constricts, you have high blood pressure. If the smooth muscle dilates, it lowers the pressure. If this is your windpipe in your throat and it constricts, you have asthma and you have wheezing. If the smooth muscle dilates, it's a lot easier to breathe. Okay. So those are the three types of muscle. Let's finish up now with skin. Okay, so when we look at skin, there's only two models here that we'll look at and they have the exact same structure. So once I do one, we'll see the overlap to the other. Skin has all four types of tissue. Now we're gonna cover epithelium next week. So hopefully you have time to even go ahead and look at some of my pre-recorded videos. Uh, you can either find them on my YouTube channel or you can find them here as well. So this top layer, this is the top layer of skin, right? If you look on the left, you can see this category one, category two, and then this region three. So number one, as we see the answer key here to the right, that's your epidermis. And this epidermis is epithelium. That's a little bit of a new word because we haven't covered it yet, except telling you that epithelium is a bunch of cells closely packed together with very little extracellular matrix. It's the grid paper with all the lines and all the checker boxes and they're closely packed together. If you have a floor that looks like they're tiles on the floor, the tiles, closely packed together, each tile is a cell. That would be looking at a tiled floor, that would be epithelium. 
and the extracellular matrix would be the grout between each tile. Okay. And then you can think of, let's say, a wall that has some framed pictures on them. They're not packed closely together. You may have three or four or five pictures separated. That's connective tissue with lots of extracellular matrix and space between them. Okay. That's generally speaking. So the top layer is epidermis. That's all epithelial tissue. That is epithelial tissue. The layer deep to that, layer two, is dermis. So you have epidermis, dermis, and all the way on the bottom where you have these yellow adipose cells, these are fat cells, that's your hypodermis or subcutaneous hypodermis or sub-Q or subcutaneous. Now the epithelium looks very different. The epidermis, which is made up of epithelium, looks very different than the dermis. The dermis has connective tissue. It's got blood vessels. It's got glands. It has muscle. It has nerve, right? So it's got a lot of different things and it's got fat down here. So fat falls under connective tissue. We have glands that falls under epithelium. You have muscle, you have nerve, right? So skin, you got everything. You got epithelium, you got connective tissue, you got nerve, you got muscle, you got them all. So the epithelium, these top layers, when you have thick skin, thick skin, thick skin is found on the palms of your hand and the soles of your feet. You need thicker skin wherever there's close contact to surfaces, right? So if you walk barefoot, you need more protection on the soles of your feet. If you, during handstands or doing push-ups, right? you need more protection on your palms. So wherever you have thicker skin, there's gonna be more layers of skin compared to areas that are thinner, thinner areas. So when we look at the epidermis, in the thicker areas, like the palms and the sole of the feet, we're going to see stratum layers. You see stratum cornum, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and then the stratum germinativum. We have five layers. One, two, three, four, five stratum layers. And the easy way to remember them, there's a little silly saying, it's share loves getting skin Botox. Share loves getting skin Botox. Now, if you don't know who Cher is, Cher uh, was a singer, she was an actress, um, probably out of her prime now, but uh, very, very famous in her day. But everyone says she looks so young and she's probably in her 70s, okay? But she doesn't look a day old, older than 40 or something. So how does she do it? And she's been very open. She's had lots of plastic surgery, lots of Botox. So I'm not teasing her by saying that she's been very open in many interviews about it. So Cher with a C, C-H-E-R, Cher loves getting skin Botox. So Cher with the C loves for lucidum, getting granulosum, spinosum skin. Botox is this last one. It's tricky because stratum germinativum is also known as the stratum basal. The stratum germinativum, this germinative layer is also known as the basal layer. So we say Cher loves getting skin Botox, basal layer. And that would be from superficial to deep. This number two is the stratum corneum, the basal layer, is down here, all the way in the bottom, that dark purple. This is where you have your stem cells. This is where you have your stem cells. So the cells multiply and divide down here at the bottom and they start to push upward and they migrate upward. 
and it takes about 30 days to get up here to layer two, which is the stratum corneum, which is dead keratinocytes, dead skin cells. These keratinocytes up here are dead and they just slough off. And it takes about four weeks journey to go from the bottom layer to the top layer, okay? So Cher loves getting skin Botox. They make up layer one, which is the epidermis. Layer two is the dermis and layer two has two regions. It has a papillary region up on top and it has a reticular region down below. So you have number eight, which is the papillary layer or papillary portion of the dermis. And then you have number 10, which is the reticular layer. Papillary is like the upper 20%. And then the reticular is the lower 80%. So there's only two layers, but there's lots of neat structures that we have there. You can see you've got the shaft of the hair. These are your hair follicles, right? And then you have this gland, which is your oil gland. That's called a sebaceous gland. And the oil gland secretes oil, moves upwards up the shaft and starts to create this seal, if you would, this seal to close the opening between the hair and the skin. You don't want bacteria coming in here. When you get a bacteria that comes in, you get this infection of the sebaceous gland. That's called acne. So this oil also acts as like an antibacterial shield to the skin. So the oils that move up have these antibacterial properties. What attaches to that hair is this muscle called the erector pili muscle. The erector pili, when this contracts, like if someone scratches their nails on a blackboard or you feel like you're in danger walking down a dark alley, you get goosebumps when that contracts. It's part of that sympathetic response to, let, to alert yourself to know that there's danger. Right When animals are about to fight, if you look at a cat, when it's in fear, all the hair on its back stands on end due to these muscles that attach to them. And that's a sympathetic response. It's supposed to puff up the animal to make it look really fearful, to scare its opponent. Okay, so this is the sebaceous gland, which is an oil gland. And this is the same thing, it's just cut here. This is a sweat gland, this is a sweat gland, and this is a sweat gland, this is just cut. But the proper name for a sweat gland is called a sudoriferous, sudiferous, sudoriferous, sudiferous duct. So this is the sudiferous gland, this is the sudiferous duct. So you produce sweat, it moves up out through the sweat pore, and it evaporates and it helps to cool your body off. Okay, so you have a sebaceous gland and a sudoriferous gland. Sudoriferous is your sweat gland. In the dermis, we have some neurological tissue. Number one is Meisner's corpuscle. That is your tactile receptor. It's for light touch, right? If an insect or a bug is crawling on you, it's not really like a mosquito is walking. You can feel it. It's very superficial. Those are your Meisner's corpuscles. Deeper down here, number 12, that's your piscinian corpuscle, number 12. Piscinian corpuscle, that's deep pressure. So up here, which is more superficial to the epidermis, right? It's close, closer to the surface. That's for a light touch, but the piscinian corpuscle is more for deeper pressure. Down here at the bottom, number 13, this, these are adipose cells. This is basically fat cells for insulation. Okay, so those are the main structures of the skin. Let's look at them again down here in this model. On the right, you can see number one, Roman numeral two, Roman numeral three. One is your epidermis, two is your dermis, three is the subcutaneous. And again, number one, you have Cher loves getting skin Botox. So those are the different layers here of you know, stratum corneum being the top layer, the germinativum or basal layer stratum again being the bottom layer. Number two, this is your dermis. The upper part is the papillary region and then the mid to lower is the reticular region. Within that dermis, we have the hair shaft, 
you have your oil gland, which is your sebaceous gland. You have the erector pili muscle attaching to it. You have your sweat gland, that's the sudiferous gland. That's your sweat duct and your sweat pore. You have your tactile receptor up here, which is your Meisner's corpuscle. That's for light touch. But down here at the bottom is your Piscinian corpuscle. That's for deep pressure. And in the subcutaneous, there's lots of blood vessels down here. That is uh, your adipocytes or your adipocytes and fat cells. Notice that blood vessels are in the dermis and in the hypodermis. You don't see blood vessels in the epidermis. So if you scratch yourself and there's no blood, we know you just did a superficial scratch of the epidermis. Once you start bleeding, we know that it's deeper into the dermis or even into the subcutaneous or the hypodermis, okay? So these are the stratum layers again. Cher loves getting skin Botox. We'll look at them more detail when we cover epithelial next week and I can actually show you some slides to go over that. Okay, let me stop the screen share here and the recording and then we'll take some questions.